All right, time for questions. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my channel, if an idea pops into your brain, just write it out. I'll gather them all up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get started. Alpha 581. Hey Fraser, we know that the moon's gravity pulls on the Earth's oceans, which causes the tides. But my question is, does the moon also pull on Earth's atmosphere? Great question. And the answer is yes, it does. In fact, there's a thing called atmospheric tides. And so just like with the oceans, as the moon passes above the Earth, it's pulling on the atmosphere with its gravity and causing the atmosphere to bulge on one side and, and bulge on the opposite side and uh, you know gets redistributed on, on the sides of the planet. But the bigger impact comes from the sun, from the, the, the solar wind activity from the sun causes the Earth's atmosphere to puff out and sort of contract back in. And that's more than the impact that you get from the gravity coming from the moon. So yes, you do get gravitational atmospheric tides, but the sun has more impact on that. Christian McCracken, is there a website which will tell me the best area near me for stargazing? The best place to go is called the Dark Sky Finder. And it's a website, it's a wonderful website. I use this all the time to help people find dark sky locations. So what it is, is it is a map of Google Earth. And then on top of that, it has a map of light pollution. So you can sort of see, and you can explore around on the map. You can see where you live and see what amounts of light pollution there is, and then places where the light pollution isn't that bad. And so one of the things that I really recommend that people do is, you know, if you've never seen the Milky Way or you've never really seen what it's like to be in a true dark sky environment, make a road trip of it. You should be able, even if you live on the East Coast, if you live in New York City, there is reasonably dark skies within about two to three hour drive from where you live. And so I recommend go to the dark sky finder, find these locations. There are going to be parks that are relatively nearby you gather together up a bunch of friends and go on a road trip and see the Milky Way and see the night sky. If you want to sort of double down, go when there's like some kind of meteor shower, like in the summertime, the Perseid meteor shower, it's in August, it's warm in the Northern Hemisphere, go to one of these dark sky sites, see the Perseids, see the Milky Way, appreciate the night sky for what we grew up with. We evolved to have this dark sky with the Milky Way and the stars every night. And if you've never seen it, it's something that you should knock off your bucket list. So dark sky finder, find some dark skies, plan an event, take a bunch of friends, take some hot chocolate and see the Milky Way with your own eyes. Yakov, Bargle Analytical Instruments. Hey Fraser, do you think that if one country, let's say China, decides to put a huge satellite with a laser to clear low Earth orbit from debris, will other countries allow it? It is a game-changing weapon after all. You're exactly right. I mentioned in the last episode that one of the best ideas that's been proposed is a space-based laser that would help deorbit orbital debris. But what's the difference between a chunk of orbital debris and an enemy satellite? So one of these space-based laser systems could absolutely uh, blind, destroy, uh, damage, and deorbit satellites from other nations. And so if China or anyone decides to do this for cleaning up space junk, you're going to expect that everybody else who has satellites is going to be very concerned about whether or not those the satellite gets used for peace or could potentially be used as a weapon. Like so many things, right? They can be used for peaceful, for peaceful purposes and they can be used as weapons. So that's just the reality of all of this modern technology. Danny Filth. Hey Fraser, if Hawking could have lived a couple of months again, he would have seen what he spent most of his life studying, an actual photograph of a black hole. I didn't mention this in the QA and I was going to mention it, but then I kind of forgot and, and but Stephen Hawking died and that's super sad. I mean, he lived an amazing and long life considering the, the horrible ALS disease that he had, but he gave so much in terms of science communication. I read some of his books or tried to read them. It was an amazing impact on so many people. So uh, what a treasure to have as, as a science communicator, as a physicist, and his passing is a real loss to, to, to all of us. And you're exactly right. The Event Horizon Telescope has taken its picture. The scientists are collating the data. And within the next couple of months, 
we're going to see the first ever pictures of the center, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now it's going to be like a blob, right? Prepare yourselves, it's not going to look like anything like interstellar, but it's still the fact that we're going to get those first images, something that he spent a good chunk of his life trying to understand, feels kind of bittersweet that, that he won't have been able to have seen it. So, farewell Stephen Hawking, thank you for everything. Matei Matolsky. Hey Fraser, great show. I have a question. What are the most expensive but technically still realistic space missions that have been proposed so far? What could we achieve with today's economy and technology if we fell into an Apollo mindset again? Man, I, I don't even want to think about it because I'll just get sad. Back in the Apollo era, the US spent about 5% of its economy, of its government funding, on space exploration and NASA during the moon race. Now it's one tenth that. So the amount of spending has gone down significantly. Of course, we're seeing other things like SpaceX and so on rising. And the reality is, is like right now, there are so many interesting opportunities. When, when the SpaceX BFR finally does launch and you get their costs down as much as they think, they think it's going to be about $7 million per launch, which is one one hundredth the price of traditional, say, launches on an Atlas. And, and it'll be hundreds of tons to orbit compared to dozens of tons to orbit. So we are entering this realm, theoretically, where our access to space is at a scale that we've just never imagined. And what could we do with that? And so, for example, the BFR should be able to launch from Earth, fly to the moon, land on the moon, and return to Earth. Like just one of these, you know, $7 million rocket launches, flies to the moon, lands on the moon, and then returns to Earth. So I think that, that we don't know really what's going to be possible until we've gone through a couple of decades of the future under rockets like the BFR and, and what is coming out of, out of Blue Origin. It's kind of exciting time. I'd love to see there's space telescopes like Louvoir, you know, 30 to 50 meter space telescopes at one of the Lagrange points. I'd like to see bases on the moon. I'd like to see some kind of larger rotating space station test it out, start constructed. There's just a lot of stuff. It's all possible. It's just about, about setting the funding and having the will. Once we get things like mining on the moon, you know, resources in space are starting to pay for itself, then we'll truly be off and who knows what we'll be able to accomplish. So, so we're at a funny time to try and make these kinds of predictions. Ask me again in 10 years. Homu. How does long hair act under artificial gravity? Will it hang down or stream backwards? It depends on the amount of gravity you're experiencing. So I did that video about artificial gravity and I was talking about, about the difference in gravity that you would experience from the head to your feet. So, and the other thing is you get this thing called the Coriolis effect where, where you would, again, you're experiencing these different levels of, of gravity. And so, I don't know, would it kind of stream behind you a little bit? Would it sort of stream off a bit to the side? We need to perform the experiments. Uh, but one of the things that I really love is to see astronauts with, with, you know, who are trying to be in zero gravity with long hair. That's hilarious. I'm going to show you a quick video here as you can see one of the astronauts trying to wash her hair in space. And you can see sort of how, how we really do need artificial gravity. Matthew Ryan. Did you set your green screen to Endor on purpose? Our green screen has only one setting. It's all Endor, all the time. Uh, as I mentioned in that video, where we are in Vancouver Island, uh, they shot the third part of the third movie here. So literally, there could be speeder bikes zipping around here in the forest. And Ewoks. Haven't seen one. Jim Becker. Fraser, what method do you think will be the real reason for mankind's death here on Earth? Will it be from our sun diving and engulfing us in some X number of years from now? Or will it be because we finally get the big asteroid hitting us, like what killed off the dinosaurs? Or will it be because someone gets mad at someone and starts a nuclear war, or because our magnetic shield decays and allowing killer radiation, because our ozone layer depletes, and so on and so on? Too many different ways, I can't name them all. Let's start with the sun, right? The sun is going, is slowly heating up, and it's probably going to 
kill all life on Earth in about a billion years. But that's a long time. Like the chances that we're going to last a billion years seems pretty remote to me. So uh, I think what's going to wipe out humanity is probably going to be humanity. We're going to come up with some kind of technology that is going to do us all in. And the two ones that I think are the most likely are artificial intelligence and some kind of bioengineering. Artificial intelligence because computers are getting stronger and more powerful and people, you know, an individual or a small lab or a research institution or some government agency could potentially come up with an AI that can cause mayhem. The other idea is some kind of bioengineering that once again, the tools to be able to hack the genetic code, to be able to create life forms, viruses, bacteria, that kind of thing is getting into the hands of individuals. And so when we see individuals like shoot up schools or individuals set off bombs, we can imagine an individual releasing a nasty AI or we can see an individual releasing some kind of bacterial agent. So that's what I think is going to be the thing that we should be most concerned about and should be trying to come up with defenses now before we run into some kind of risk. So those, those are how I think it will happen realistically. Frame drop films. Hey Fraser Gray Channel, my seven-year-old son Hayden is fascinated by space and wonders how large in light years is our galaxy from one end to the other and how long it would take with our current technology to traverse this distance. Thanks and keep up the excellent work, Steve and Hayden. Hey Hayden, the Milky Way is about 120,000 light years across, which uh, it, in other words, it takes light 120,000 years to get from one side of the Milky Way to the other. And where we are, we're about, say, 25 to 28, 26,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way, and then about another 35,000 light years away from the edge of the Milky Way. And so travel in the Milky Way is going to be really, really tough because we can't move the speed of light. So even if you could go the speed of light, it would take you, for us, it would take us, say, 26,000 years to get to the center of the Milky Way traveling the speed of light. So for the next few hundred years anyway, we're probably not going to go anywhere beyond this solar system and we're going to fully explore. But then, the kind of amazing thing is that if you can build robots that can make more copies of robots, not even traveling the speed of light, you can explore and colonize the entire Milky Way in about 1 to 10 million years if you're just moving 10% the speed of light. So Milky Way is a big, big place. There's 200 to 400 billion stars here for us to eventually explore. So we got our work cut out for us. Thanks for the question. All right, that's it. Another week, another question show. It's very cold. <laughs> I was thinking that spring would arrive, but clearly it is not. I underlayered. Glad I have my gloves with me. Anyway, wherever you are on the channel, if a question pops into your brain, write it down on any video. I will gather a bunch of them up and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.